Welcome to the regular meeting of the City Club of Portland. I'm Mary Kramer, president of the club, and I'd like to welcome our radio audience, club members, and their guests. Our first order of business is to introduce a new member, and I'll ask him to stand. He is Brennan Doyle, Manager, Drinking Water Task Force, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Brendan, welcome. We're glad to have you with us. We'd like to thank Linda Klingen, a uh, City Club member who convinced our new member to join. Some information about some upcoming meetings. Next Friday, January the 18th, we'll have Winston Ndugani, Canon of the Episcopal Church of South Africa and Chief Assistant to Bishop Desmond Tutu. He will speak on South Africa, the way ahead. We will be here in the Portland Hilton. Tuesday, January 22nd, we have an open forum entitled, Is Gold Mining Good for Oregon? It's sponsored by our Energy and Environment Standing Committee and will feature Jean Cameron, who is Policy Director for the Oregon Environmental Council, and Dave Barrows, Professional Lobbyist with Dave Barrows and Associates. That open forum will be at noon to 1.30 p.m., U.S. Bank Corp Tower, 111 Southwest 5th, the 26th floor conference rooms, B and C. This open forum is free and open to the public. On Friday, January 25th, we will have Judith Romaley, president of Portland State University. She will take the podium to discuss her vision of an urban grant university and the future of Portland State. Dr. Romaley became the first woman to head an Oregon State institution of higher learning earlier this year. We will again be at the Portland Hilton. We want to make sure that our radio audience knows that we welcome guest attendance at our Friday meetings. You must make a reservation if you'd like to have lunch, so we need you to call the City Club office at 228-7231 and talk to Jenny and she'll make you a, re a reservation should you wish to attend. Our board host today is Chuck Williams, who is a member of the Board of Governors and is Media Relations Officer for Good Samaritan Hospital. He has the privilege of asking the first question. The second question today, and I understand that the mic will be placed over here on my right, will be asked by Molly Ingram, member of the Science and High Tech Standing Committee. As usual, we will open the meeting to questions from City Club members. We give preference to those who move to the mic. Uh, we usually have cards on the table if you want to write a question. Uh, if so, write it out, hold it up, and our staff members will pick it up. Now for today's program, waking up to sleep disorders. We've been living in a dream world, and it's time to examine our attitudes about sleep. For example, am I wasting my time if I sleep eight hours? Are adolescents lazy if they sleep 10 hours? Is it good to have a television in your bedroom so you can turn it on and let it lull you to sleep? Our speaker today is ringing the alarm to wake us up to the problems of fatigue in the workplace, health risk, and human potential lost from what is called the national sleep debt. Dr. William DeMint, professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Stanford University School of Medicine, began his career at the University of Chicago, where he discovered rapid eye movement sleep and the relationship to dreaming. He founded the world's first sleep disorder clinic, and he has been a leader in sleep research authoring over 200 articles. His contributions are recognized worldwide, and he has a long list of, of honors, which include several silver and a bronze Rush Medal from the American Psychiatric Association, the Nathaniel Kleitman Prize from the Association of Sleep Disorder Centers, and the National Institutes of Health Career Scientists fifth consecutive award. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dimmitt.
the uh, thank you very much, President Kramer. <clears throat> I when you said the question gold mining is gold mining good for Oregon? Uh, that certainly evokes a lot of images, but it made me think of uh, something. Uh, and I assume that this is a group that is sort of similar to another group that I spoke to several years ago, and that was a, a young president's organization. And we were up in Jasper Park, and there were two speakers, and, and I uh, sort of thought of it as a very, very uh, excellent occasion. I wanted to do very well and have a talk that people would find very, very interesting. So, so the title of my talk was The Relation of Sleep to longevity. And then I had a little subtitle, sleep well and live longer. And I thought, boy, that'll really grab people. So <clears throat> I was in Jasper Park with all the young presidents. And in the morning, I went to the place where I was to give my lecture. And there were about 200 chairs and about 10 people. And I, I was a little bit dismayed. And I, I thought, maybe uh, there weren't that many people there. I went to the other room. There were about 200 chairs and 300 presidents were, were standing there. And I felt, wow, that's a, too bad. But I looked at the title of the talk that the other lecturer was giving, and then I understood. And it was, How to Hold On to Your Personal Wealth. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, I'd like to uh, start out by saying that um, I'm, I've been learning a lot on on the, the National Commission for Sleep Disorders Research because it it forces you to take a very, very different perspective than the perspective of a professor or a researcher or even a doctor. Uh, and one of our witnesses, uh, we, we were in uh, Portland yesterday uh, holding hearings and, and receiving testimony from witnesses. And on uh, <clears throat> Tuesday, we had a day of hearings in Los Angeles. And down there, one of the witnesses said, and, and, and we collect quotes because it, it's just astounding uh, how quotable our witnesses have been, said, sleep is one of those things that we all do every single day of our lives, and yet we know nothing about it. And I wrote that down as quickly as I could. But it, it makes me say this as a response. <clears throat> because the problem is not that nothing is known. Rather, the problem is nothing is taught. Over the past two decades, an encyclopedic amount of clinical knowledge has been accumulated about sleep. A small group of specialists has finally pulled back the curtain of the night to reveal literally scores of specific sleep pathologies that afflict about 100 million Americans. For example, right now, at least one person in five in this room has a diagnosable sleep disorder. And the only thing that will prevent you eventually from suffering from a sleep disorder is a premature death. <laughs> <laughs> the knowledge, this knowledge also led to the establishment of a, of a new clinical specialty sleep disorders medicine, which requires specific training. It requires uh, now to really qualify passing the examination of the American Board of Sleep Disorders Medicine. And then beyond that, it requires experience. And in sleep disorders medicine, as in any other specialty, experience is absolutely necessary. And I think when a, when a seasoned sleep specialist has seen several thousand patients, he's then really able to bring the benefits of the field to each patient that comes to him. Now, I think this kind of excellence, which is, which is very rare in America, there, what we are also finding is now suddenly there have become a lot of what uh, Bobby Haggerty this morning called pop specialists that are kind of growing up here and there like weeds. But, it, but the, the true excellence that that a few people, a few centers, relatively few, I should say, maybe 150 across the United States have achieved, is really exemplified by the centers here in Portland. And I, I think that the Sleep Disorder Center at Good Samaritan Hospital is, is one of the best in America, if not the best. And the sleep research and biological rhythm research that's being done 
at Oregon Health Sciences University, again, is just outstanding. And when I used to come up here, when Dr. Jerry Rich was a pioneer, and this was quite a while ago, uh, I was a little uneasy because I thought these two great institutions were kind of rivals, and, and I liked them both, and I'd sort of, hit going back and forth, I wouldn't mention that I had been to Good Sam if I was over at Oregon Health Sciences, but I, it's really a good feeling that there's unity now. It's just a, so it's, it, that unity, I think, has made these institutions, if not the most outstanding, certainly in the top five uh, in America. So that was, it was really quite thrilling to be here. Uh, <clears throat> the fact that, that there is a clinical specialty has also means that there's now a professional society. It's called the American Sleep Disorders Association, and it has about 1,500 members. And it, its aims are to promote the field, of course, and to promulgate uh, excellent clinical practice and, and scientific knowledge. And the fact that there's a society finally uh, with, with pretty, pretty good dues, I would say, uh, led to the, to the ability to, to uh, become the client of a uh, Washington lobbyist. Maybe we probably had about 1% of his time. But that <clears throat> led to some ability to inform Congress, the Congress of the United States of this new specialty afflicting so many hundreds of millions which did not have a place anywhere, either in the educational system or or the federal biomedical establishment. So uh, that led to the creation of the National Commission on Sleep Disorders Research, whose job it is to survey through hearing testimony, looking at documents, uh, carrying out studies, et cetera, what, what the scope of the problem is and what, what its magnitude is and, and what, in fact, should be done about it. And it's quite a daunting task, I can assure you. And it, Given what I know about, about the per pervasiveness of these problems and their seriousness and the difficulty of bringing adequate resources to bear, I, I uh, it, you know, just we cannot fail. That's, that's all there is to it. Now, we were extraordinarily pleased um, to be invited to Portland by Senator Hatfield and his staff because obviously he is a, is a very important person on the Washington scene and the fact that he he recognizes the importance of this commission and and its work is extremely gratifying. Now we were invited, uh, I don't know, six months ago, I guess, quite a while ago, and so of course the, I had this special new anxiety when the elections came around, and uh, instead of paying attention in California, I, I had my eye on the Northwest, and and early on I was, re I was really quite anxious. I was amazed at how involved I was, and very 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 pleased and relieved. Uh, at the outcome. Uh, I also very impressed by, by Senator Hatfield's really excellent staff. I mean, it, it's, um, a lot of people are cynical about Congress, but when, when you meet people like Mr. Ray Naff and, and uh, Bobby Haggerty, you know, it's extraordinarily reassuring that such energetic and intelligent people are doing such good work. And, and uh, particularly I owe a debt to Bobby Haggerty who organized these hearings. Now, in Los Angeles, I did all the work, and I can tell you, to get, to get all the witnesses and do all that when you got a full-time job somewhere else is, it is a killer. And to come up to Portland, having done almost nothing, and have the best hearings that we've ever had is, is just terrific, and I'm profoundly grateful. Uh, yesterday at the press conference, I said Portland is one of my favorite cities. The Benson is absolutely my favorite hotel. The uh, <laughs> The Good Sam is my favorite sleep center, and, you know, how could it be nicer? Um, well, I'd like to begin to comment a little bit on what the commission has already found, and it's, it's just extraordinary how much you can learn when you listen to people tell their stories. And, and, it, and I, um, I really haven't done that in my life until this commission came into existence, but I, but I now can understand how how the Congress of the United States, through the process of hearings, can, in fact, try to stay on top of such a complex, awesome uh, thing as the American society and its relationship with all of the other countries in the world and all of the things that are going on, including the crisis in the Gulf, of course. But at any rate, there's one thing that has, has I have to make a side comment uh, that I, uh, I've been here now several days, and I'm going on to Walla Walla, Washington, 
and I, I, I think that people in the Northwest are not as obsessed with, you know, only eating a one leaf of lettuce. But I, I realize I've already, I've already gained a couple of pounds, <laughs> because, because my pants are just a tiny bit tight. And but I was looking over, and it's exemplified by the number of people who are sitting at the coffee-only table. I thought that that tells tells me what people are like in Portland. But at any rate, what the commission has found, and, and it's really we have a consensus on this fact, uh, and it's the magnitude is really overwhelming, and that is simply this: the house of education at every level has no bedroom. Sleep, sleep, the facts of sleep and sleep disorders medicine and sleep pathologies and how sleep affects the lives of each and every person on earth, these facts are not presented in grade school, in high school, in college, in medical school, in residencies, in continuing medical education, they're just nowhere. There are very few people who know them and that's it. And they're doing the best they can, but, but that knowledge gap is the single big problem. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples. <clears throat> the commission has um, a group doing a study of medical, medical school education. We've had the preliminary results, and we found that at least half of, of 150 medical schools have zero information on sleep in the curriculum. Uh, the average in the other 50 percent is one hour, one hour of teaching. Now, there are one or two places where there are people like Dr. Bob Sack or Dr. Jerry Rich who do more, but they are, they are in a very small minority. So the doc person graduates from medical school knowing nothing more about sleep than he knew when he was in the third grade. At the primary care level, the gatekeepers of medicine, we also have a, a, a study. It's a little more difficult to really get in and find out what's going on, but we're doing doing uh, doing the best we can. One way is to access the computerized databases uh, that are used now in clinical practices, large group practices, particularly for billing purposes, and you can you can get what are called the ICD-9 codes, diagnostic codes, and there's the Inter International Classification of Disease in which every illness has a number, and so do the sleep disorders. For example, an illness called obstructive sleep apnea, which is one of the most prevalent and serious of the specific sleep disorders, has a code. Uh, 744.52, I think, or I'm close. And so you access, and we've accessed 10 million, 10 million records for this code, and we found it present maybe 50 times. I mean, it's so close to zero, I say zero. We look for a, a problem called narcolepsy. That was essentially zero in the coding. We look for a problem called delayed sleep phase syndrome. That was absolute zero in 10 million 10 million cases, and I could sort of go on and on. It's not being coded. Maybe people are seeing these things, but they're not being coded. If they're not being coded, they're not being billed. And you all know that billing is a, is a bottom line of medical practice. <laughs> Another thing we've done is to, to actually examine 10,000 charts in, in the primary care practices scattered around the country. And in 10,000 uh, charts, we found notations about sleep complaints in about 1% when we know that complaining, at least, is, is around 30 to 40 percent in the general population, so that's way down. And then if you actually look what happens when a person complains, you know, then you get a series of, of things you would say to make people laugh if you were at a sleep meeting. Uh, the doctors just don't know what to do. Um, then finally, we're doing something that's kind of naughty but extraordinarily enlightening as we and this is not the commission, I hasten to add. The commission would never, ever do anything like this. But, but someone is doing a position paper that is based on a study where an actor has been hired and been coached in a specific sleep disorder and its symptoms and how it's presented, and he simply goes to a doctor's office and gives his complaint, and then, then we're able to see what happens. And I think, I think that's necessary to get some samples so we can really know, and uniformly, uniformly, uh, an adequate uh, history is not taken, and very frequently a physician will say, uh, what would you like me to do? Uh, because he, I, my only assumption is he doesn't know and he doesn't want the responsibility for making a mistake, so he's going to put it back to the, to the person who has a complaint. Now, this is not, this is not any, anything 
pejorative about primary care physicians. I mean, if it's not taught, what are they supposed to do? And, and the final thing I think that the commission feels is really a crisis is that if you go, if you say sleep is half of everything or a third of your lives, it's got hundreds of pathologies, it afflicts 100 million Americans, it's supremely important. Uh, and then a person goes through grade school, high school, college, medical school, residency, practice, and nobody says anything. And then I make that statement. He says, you know, the, this guy has got to be the most grandiose person I've ever, I've ever heard. There's no mindset that is receptive at that point. So there's, a, so there's an obstacle and a barrier. But the reason it's a crisis, in my opinion, is that we've listened now to patient after patient after patient after patient tell of visits to doctors, no response, desperate to have something done, nothing is done, year after year after year, 10 years pass, they finally get to someone like Jerry Rich, and then lo and behold, a miracle happens. Uh, we heard a patient say, uh, I was, at least he had uh, severe obstructive sleep apnea, well that leads to a very severe daytime sleepiness, said I was brain dead for 50 years. I couldn't get through college, couldn't get a job, Finally, he got to someone who knew something and, and that is very treatable, and he says he said it was like I had a brain transplant. I mean, it was like I was reborn or I was born for the first time. So that we can't allow so many of our citizens to, to go through their lives not getting the help they need. Um, now, this knowledge gap has two very important aspects. And one of them is exemplified. I have some handouts out on the table. One is the reprint from Time Magazine, who, who uh, kind of very, very um, uh, happily had this cover story entitled The Sleep Gap, which is just exactly what we're thinking and seeing. But the knowledge gap has led to chronic sleep deprivation in America. And it, it has led to, to a situation that is so serious that it's interfering with the societal mission. And, let, and I have some examples in handouts, but let me just give you a few examples um, that I think are very, very dramatic. The, the first example that you're probably all very well acquainted with in the sense of the event, and that is the Exxon Valdez uh, grounding, and that was investigated by the National Transportation Safety Board. And, and the National Transportation Safety Board is the one federal agency that has the lowest knowledge gap because, it, because there's a member now who, his name is uh, uh, Dr. John Lauber, who, who has uh, actually done some sleep research, and he understands sleep deprivation. And so they have, since his uh, appointment to the board, they have instituted routinely, in every accident they investigate, they, they go back 72 hours on a sleep-wake schedule of everyone involved. So that, you know, when were you in bed? How, how long were you working? What did you do? And if they find that there's any sign of sleep, the possibility of sleep deprivation due to very short hours in bed, then they go back further and see how much of a sleep debt has accumulated. If, they, if that in type of investigation shows that that person is sleep deprived and then there's solid evidence that their performance was impaired during a critical moment, then they are willing to attribute the cause of the accident to fatigue and sleep deprivation. And I think that is a, a very, very important step forward. Now, the third mate who was at the helm of the Exxon Valdez, and if you actually read the detailed description of events minute by minute leading up to the grounding, there's, there is uh, unambivalent, unambiguous documentation of impaired performance that is just, you know, and you couldn't possibly understand it if you didn't know that how much he had slept in the past 72 hours. And so the board had concluded that the primary cause of that grounding, which cost $2.2 billion in hard cash and inestimable damage to the environment, was due to sleep deprivation. And uh, I will say this maybe several times, a one-hour nap a couple of hours before the grounding probably would have led to the accident not happening. Now, our society doesn't accept that sleepy people should take a nap. Another accident off Rhode Island is the World Prodigy 
uh, oil tanker grounded, uh, major oil spill. The master of the vessel uh, showed impaired performance and, and in fact bizarre performance uh, at the moment when his alert skills were most needed to maneuver the vessel he went below to his cabin to attend to unessential details. Um, nobody could understand that except when they looked at his sleep schedule and discovered he had been awake for 36 consecutive hours and prior to that had slept five and then the day before that had had a, another uh, low amount of sleep. There have been several head-on train collisions that have been investigated by this technique and, and where the primary cause was found to be sleep deprivation. The National Transportation Safety Board also did a study of fatal to the driver truck accidents and came to the conclusion that sleep deprivation was more important than drugs and alcohol in leading to these accidents. So at least one agency has begun to recognize the importance of sleep and the cost of the sleep gap. And, and then these are dramatic accidents. Uh, another one where it's a little less obvious, but if you look at the schedules, it certainly had to be a factor, was the, was the erroneous launch of the Challenger with the uh, defective O-rings. Uh, the two key managers who absor were supposed to absorb the data from Morton Thiokol on the night before the launch and those data, the subsequent uh, investigation showed, did reveal that they, the temperatures were too low to be sure of the performance. The, the report says there was a chance to cancel the launch, which was missed at that point. And two of the managers had, had had three hours of sleep for the 48 hours before they were called upon for high-level intellectual performance to make a decision that cost the society billions of dollars, ultimately, in terms of the accident and, and of course, set back the space program, maybe in, it will never recover. Uh, had they taken a nap before that, before that uh, conference, uh, it might have been different. Had, they, had anybody had enough respect for sleep to say, hey, you need to take a nap, let's do that, and if that was respected and condoned by society, I think it would be a better world. Now. And in, in it goes way beyond that. Um, we, uh, we used to have a facility at Stanford University called the Stanford Summer Sleep Camp. And we, did, we learned there how to really evaluate the need for sleep and how to measure physiologically and directly, directly and objectively daytime sleepiness, how the level of alertness. And we found, because uh, some of our first studies were of Stanford undergraduates, uh, to our amazement, with, with eight hours of sleep at night, these undergraduates, about half of them, were pathologically sleepy. And, uh, you know, so they can't be just Stanford undergraduates. So, you know, they, um, but we then studied young children uh, who are 10 years old, 11, 10, and they, they, of course, and everybody had their normal sleep, they would be 10 hours in bed and, and about 9 hours and 40 minutes of sleep on the average, and they were t optimally alert in the daytime. So, so we went back and said, my goodness, maybe the college students aren't getting enough sleep. So we had a group spend 10 hours in bed for several consecutive nights, and we measured their daytime alertness, and it, it began to increase, and it began to approach the alertness of the young children. So his answer was totally simple. They're so sleepy because they aren't getting enough sleep and they don't know how much they need. Now that study's been confirmed over and over and over, but more recently a new dimension has been added, and that's been added by colleagues at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan, Dr. Tom Roth and Dr. Timothy Rears, and they, they did these kinds of studies in 176 young adults aged 18 to 22 who were, who were healthy, but selected on the basis of responding to a questionnaire that they had no problem with being sleepy in the daytime. No problem. When they were made, and then they came into study, they spent their nominal time in bed, usually around eight hours, had the alertness measures the next day, and in addition to that, had very comprehensive uh, testing of intellectual cognitive performance. Well, 40% were at a level that we consider in the twilight zone. 
and if you see someone who has, who is a patient, then he has pathological sleepiness. Forty percent, forty percent. Uh, well, people say, well, it's so pervasive, it's normal. And there's this, there's this uh, kind of group that says, well, if it's all over the place, it's normal. And we have this controversy in older citizens about failures to breathe during sleep. And because, because uh, there are a couple of things like that that, that you find in 60% of the population, there's a, there's a very vocal group that say, well, that's normal because it's so pervasive. Well, to be that sleepy is not normal. It's not optimal. It's not good. Uh, they then uh, had to pay a group, I guess, or they persuaded a subset to spend 10 hours in bed for a week. And of course, if you spend 10 hours in bed, you sleep, you sleep more. And then they retested them. Of course, their physiological alertness was significantly improved. But what was more important is their intellectual performance was improved. So here is a very large group of normal young adults who are walking around impaired. That means they're impaired in college, they're impaired in the workplace, they're impaired in high school, and they don't even know it. We don't know it. And what one of the challenges the commission faces is to try to put some dollar value on that type of impairment. Uh, someone suggested to me that's why Japan is in the lead now. But, but unfortunately, the Japanese are also sleep deprived. Um, that would make a great image, though. Uh, so, so the reason for that, of course, is just the total ignorance about how much sleep we need. Now, the other major problem, that there are two major public health problems. One is the sleep gap, and the other one that the commission has identified is the pandemic of undiagnosed and untreated sleep disorders. And as I told you, 100 million Americans, well, that, that is about 100 different specific problems. Now, some of these problems are relatively rare. I, ha I wish, I, I try to think, of should I s show slides? I decided not to. But if I were going to show slides, I had two of my favorite slides. And they, they simply list sleep disorders in two ways. The first way is by, by how serious they are. And at the top of the list is a relatively rare specific disorder called fatal familial insomnia. Y you know, you die. And you die in about, th I don't know, three to five years. It is, it, 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 uh, the first symptom is insomnia. People can't sleep. And then they deteriorate and die. Uh, there are, at autopsy, you find small lesions in a specific location in the brain. And then the question is, maybe that's the sleep center. Um, but that, that's, and then there's another one that's quite rare called REM sleep related, REM sleep related, sinus arrest of the heart. And that's, there's an upheaval of the autonomic nervous system. You have a vagal arrest of the heart. The heart just stops beating. It only happens in REM sleep. Uh, we have seen 12 patients with this problem, and, and uh, 10 of them, uh, it was just an accidental discovery. That, and uh, all of the patients, and, and, and when we see it, we say the heart would stop for 10 seconds and then start again. Thank God. Um, and all these people have demand pacemakers implanted because that's the only satisfactory treatment. And then it goes down the list. Uh, and near the bottom of the list is jet lag syndrome, which is a very pervasive, very widespread disorder, but not so serious. Uh, then, I, then I list the exact same disorders by prevalence rather than seriousness. And then the, f the one that is at the very top, because if someone comes to a sleep center with a complaint of overwhelming fatigue, he could have inadequate sleep hygiene. By that, it simply means he doesn't sleep enough. And sometimes it takes a doctor to make that diagnosis. Jet lag syndrome, shift work problems are high on the list. Several insomnias, and then obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. That means that you, your throat collapses when you inhale and you can't breathe. That's quite serious. Alcohol dependent sleep disorder, delayed sleep phase syndrome, da da da, we go on down now. Fatal familial insomnia is near the bottom because it's, it's relatively rare. Now, who has the knowledge about all of these disorders? Not very many people. Uh, and, and of course, the group that doesn't have it is, is a primary care physician. Um, now, how should all of these things be changed? And I think. First of all, there need to be concepts 
uh, and there needs to be federal fostering. I, everyone's now worried about is this going to cost a lot of money, uh, but I think that we need a concept where the society and primary care physicians are sufficiently aware that they can, at the very least, know when someone with a sleep complaint should go to a specialist. And they should know that there are sleep specialists, that people who have trained, who have passed an examination, who have seen many, many patients, so they have that rich experience that is necessary. They should know that they're also, I guess you'd say, pop sleep specialists, and that they, they may be able, able to get away with handling some simple problems, but, but if someone is really desperate and has a complex problem, you're not doing that type of patient any service to send him to someone who is not qualified. And, and the awareness of that was very, very, we had at the hearings yesterday, uh, several patients would testify and, and often heart-wrenching stories, and then uh, someone who had expertise and here again, I, I'm going to embarrass him by mentioning his name so often, uh, Dr. Jerry Smith, uh, Jerry Rich again, uh, with with these very very difficult patients, complicated problems. It's just just marvelous uh, dealing with this and going the extra mile and figuring out what's going to work finally and ch turning things around for someone whose life is just just on the brink. And, and it's kind of thrilling to realize, yes, we do have such a, a fine specialty, but it doesn't yet sort of have a place. Um, so I think it's going to be public awareness, primary care awareness, and, and an expansion of the true specialists uh, in numbers that are sufficient to make the benefits of sleep disorders medicine available to society. Uh, we've heard stories about public awareness. Uh, there was a policeman, I think he got into the newspapers, and. And, you know, it's just uh, the shift work problems are just terrible. And, and I asked the question, do, you, do policemen nap when they're supposed to be protecting us at night? And he kind of hesitated, and I don't remember his exact words, but the implication was, of course, there's, there's no other way you could do this. And he, he uh, recounted an instance where he was so sleep deprived he hardly knew what he was doing, and then suddenly he was facing someone with a gun who was locked himself and his three children and his wife in a car, and there they were, and he wasn't able to perform. Uh, this, he, had, he had seen our experts here in Portland, and this situation is Dr. Robert Sack, in fact, <laughs> corrected the situation. The scientists at the Oregon Health Sciences Center have devised ways to deal with, with shift work problems, and now that help is available. Um, so for that policeman, he can now function at night. You listen to truck drivers. And, uh, and medical school, ho med hospital, house staff. Uh, it just goes on and on and on. 25% of the workforce uh, have an abnormal schedule. Uh, we know very, very much now about the biological clock, and outstanding research, again, is being done here in Portland and in other centers around the world. We, we're on the verge of being able to deal with jet lag and shift work and certainly can, can make it better right now, uh, yet most industries don't know this. Most industries don't know what they're losing by these problems. There's a company in Salt Lake, by merely changing the direction of the shift rotation and extending the time on shift, potash production increased 33%. And it cost nothing. Um, things like that can be done everywhere. 40% uh, reduction in police car accidents in Philadelphia by, by those simple maneuvers. But the commissioner refused to institute the new schedule for reasons that I don't know. Finally, I would close, and hopefully I've left time enough for questions. Uh, need pub images for the public. And, and you know, our public, we do not respect sleep. The American public does not respect sleep. At a time when when all of these things were being organized, we became a 24-hour society and, and created all these problems for ourselves. Um, the practice of medicine ended when the patient fell asleep. And because of this education gap, we don't have the respect. People don't take this seriously. But yet, I like the image that there is a triumvirate of health for every individual. And 
Or you can think of it as a three-legged stool, but the stool only has two legs. It, uh, we all are aware of the need for exercise. We want to be physically fit. I think that is in the consciousness of the public. I like to ac ask witnesses, okay, you, you, don't, you don't go to bed on time, but do you exercise regularly? Oh, of course, yes, yes. Um, diet and nutrition, I think, is in the public consciousness, and, and we see that in high school education. And God knows in high school you pay a lot of attention to physical fitness, but the, the leg of this stool, the triumvirate of health, sound sleep, and optimal daytime alertness and the facts that can bring those about doesn't exist at all. And that is, that is the conclusion of the National Commission on Sleep Disorders Research. And I would hope to come back here in about two years uh, and tell you what the solutions are going to be or are starting to be put in place. But, but I know that solving the, the challenge of the knowledge gap is going to be one of the foremost and then that all of the repercussions that that will have in American society, and and it's a it's a tremendous challenge. But but I think we've all learned that 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 big challenges uh, lead to big responses. So I think I think it's something is going to happen. So I would be happy to answer any questions about about sleep mechanisms or or anything you want to know. But we're too tired to ask. Uh, <laughs> Chuck Williams, member of the Board of Governors, has the privilege of the first question. Chuck? Thanks, Mary. Uh, while you were talking, Dr. DeMent, I was writing down a note, um, which uh, I'm going to give to you in a second here. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a note written out here that says, uh, Chuck's been working very hard this week. He'll be napping today from 2 to 3 p.m. Uh, when he wakes up, he'll be alert and productive. Would you sign this for me? I'll give it to my <laughs> boss. Um, I'd like to follow up a little bit because I work in a hospital. A lot of people here work in organizations where shift work is, a, is very much a fact of life. I have a neighbor who drives trains for a living um, and has told me some stories that uh, encourage me to take other modes of transportation um, in spite of their really very good safety record. Uh, what, what can we do in terms of uh, shift workers? How, uh, a few ideas, a few policies. Are there some simple things that can be done? in terms of uh, keeping people on the same schedule, or if they're moved from shift, which way do they move? Um, can you speak to that a little bit? Well, uh, thank you. A great deal could be said about that. Uh, and I don't want to take too much time, so I can give some examples. Um, first of all, I think that I would hope that we would, we would have a sort of a change in our attitude about, uh, in fact, the, uh, I think his name is Mr. Parker, I was interviewed on the radio this morning, and he said, uh, what's, what about sleep equals sloth? And, and, you know, that's an image that has to be purged from society so that it becomes, it becomes an intelligent, creative thing to do to take a nap. And, and I, so I have to sort of go in two directions. There are the things you can do and the things that you can do to, to, when you have kind of like an emergency. So when we look at the truck drivers, uh, where it's a very difficult problem because they're, pay, in a sense, paid by the mile. And the more miles they drive, the more money they earn. And, of course, the, the more you drive, the more m miles you accumulate. So they're not motivated to work uh, only eight hours. And, and, you know. But if they, the, I think what we're going to say is that if you feel sleepy, you, the way it works is that a huge sleep debt piles up before it really becomes that sort of, yes, I'm really drowsy. That is a real danger signal. We've got to get that into the consciousness. That's when the instant you have that feeling, you've got to take a nap if you're in any danger whatsoever or you're going to place anyone else in danger. It may be Russian roulette, and there may be only one bullet in a gun with a lot of chambers, but you, no one has a right to put everyone at risk when they are dangerously sleepy. So we've got to respect pulling off the road and taking a nap. A house officer has got to be able to lie down in the waiting room and take a nap, and that's got to be respected, because that's saving lives. Um, the other thing, though, is there are well-grounded principles of dealing with shift work now, and they're going to get better. Uh, some of these have been pioneered by Dr. Al Louie here in, at the Health Sciences Center, and he's one of the leading researchers in biological rhythm research. 
bright light therapy is something that's been developed here, and it, it's relatively simple. Bright light of the order of 10,000 lux or going outside in the daytime will reset the clock, and you can aid someone in making that transfer. Because the natural period of the human biological clock is longer than 20, longer than 24 hours, that means that it's easier to delay your bedtime. In other words, if, if I delay my bedtime two hours, I am in effect creating a 26-hour day for myself if I then add the two hours on to getting up in the morning and then sort of stay that way. So, that, so when you go from day to evening shift, you are in effect extending the day and making the transition that way. That is easier than shortening the day to advance the shift. So it shift, shifting, rotating shifts should always go in the delay direction. Obviously, you have more time to adapt if you stay in a shift longer. So that can be instituted. And bright light, we now know, could be used effectively to help that shift change. And even more exciting things uh, are present in the future. So those are, those are some of the things that, that could be done. In, in emergency situations, here again, uh, with very little extra resource, I think you could, you could make sure that your surgeons who, or your young house staff surgeons or emergency room physicians who are going to be dealing with, with life and death situations are allowed to take a nap if they need to when, when the caseload is very light and that that is something, and they know there have been countless studies where a nap in the late evening, as opposed to no nap, shows a much higher level of performance through the entire night. And those studies are very dramatic, they're very conclusive, and it, it's just amazing that that type of thing hasn't been instituted, and, and it should be. Molly Ingram, member of the Science and High Tech Standing Committee, has the privilege of the second question. Molly? Thank you, Dr. Dement. Um, I, and I thank you for keeping us all awake. I know that's not easy to do after lunch, but you did a good job of it. I also want to mention I'm a graduate of Walla Walla High School, and you're going to one of the sleepiest little towns in America, so I hope you have a good time there. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Japan, and this problem being a problem uh, as well in Japan. I'm interested in knowing whether or not uh, this is a problem associated with technologically advanced countries, or what is the international picture related to these sleep disorders? Uh, that's, that's an interesting question. Not very much is known, actually. Uh, the, I saw some data from Japan, uh, and they had some kind of national survey where they did ask people when they went to bed, when they got up in the morning, and, and on large population samples. And since the turn of the century, uh, and they did this by decades, uh, they've had about a one and a half to two hour reduction in total sleep time. Now, what most people don't know, and, and why most people can't understand this, is that there are two main processes for the timing and regulation of sleep and wakefulness, and the way we view it at least, is that every 24 hours, and maybe twice in the daytime, the biological clock puts out an alerting signal to the brain or revs up the level of alertness. Meanwhile, whenever you're awake, a homeostatic process is accumulating the sleep debt. And it's doing it just like a, a credit card account and that, that you need to look at your statement for the, at least the previous week, not just yesterday. Um, so that a two-hour reduction in sleep, if it's continual, is, leads to an enormous sleep debt. You know, so you either then are overwhelmed by sleepiness or you have to make up some sleep. You have to reduce the debt. And uh, so I, I think the Japanese don't get enough sleep. I think that, that I they're a very driven society, I would say. I'm not you know, intimately acquainted with all the cultural values, et cetera, but I certainly am impressed. In fact, one of my favorite things to do is to stand where all the trains come in in Tokyo and just see them come piling in and, and to kind of look. As, as the train comes in, a lot of people are just kind of waking up and trying to get their eyes open. This is in the morning. Uh, but people, you can overcome a certain amount of sleep debt, you know, if you're really driven and motivated. I have to tell, I could tell an anecdote in that regard. I have a friend who, uh, when he, whenever he comes to dinner, if he can make it through dessert and not fall asleep, it's, it's uh, unusual. And then we go into the living room to talk, he immediately falls asleep. And yet, 
uh, he's extraordinarily intelligent. He has a Nobel Prize uh, in elementary particle physics, and he's the director of the Stanford University Linear Accelerator Center. And, and when we started pushing this sleep gap thing and the American is sleep deprived, well, he took me to task because uh, about 20 years ago, or I, uh, we didn't know how to measure daytime sleepiness, uh, and I had thought, well, you know, it doesn't really matter, but there are people who kind of exist in a sleep deprived state, so maybe, maybe we only need four hours of sleep a night. And I told him that, and then he, he tried to, to do that. Well, what he accomplished, and he's, say, like a really, uh, a real exception, because I think internal stimulation will, is an opposing force. And here's a man with an IQ of 180 doing work which is supremely exciting. He built the first uh, electron-positron colliding beams and then did this Nobel Prize winning work that he was so stimulated by his work and most of it was intellectual, not hazardous. He wasn't a truck driver. Uh, that he could tolerate a great deal of, of sleep deprivation. And that's the only way I can possibly explain it. And he, uh, he's obviously sleep deprived, no question. But, but falling asleep after dinner doesn't threaten anybody's life. Uh, but he said, gee, Bill, I, I always gave you credit for my Nobel Prize, and now you're telling me that, I, that you were totally wrong. And I said, <laughs> I had to just swallow it and say, yes, uh, sometimes we make a mistake. And that was a, that was a really big one. And I, but fortunately, the message only got out to a few close friends uh, or could have done untold damage in society. Stuart Gates, City Club member. Uh, comment, I'm, I'm, I'm a Berkeley graduate, and I can assure you in those days, uh, down at Stanford, there was a great deal of sleeping around. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, two questions, really. Why isn't sleep in the medical profession, why isn't this sort of a subset of anesthesiology? <laughs> and secondly, is memory loss attached to sleep disorder? Are they related, memory and, and, and sleep or lack of it? Um, well, anesthesiology, uh, I saw some figures not too long ago. I, I wish I could remember them, but I was very impressed at the number of instances of administering anesthesia every day in the United States. And it was like 100,000. But um, it was a very impressive number. So I was saying, gosh, we, we've never really addressed that issue of, of any possible similarity. I think we had a kind of a, a, a closure of our minds maybe 30 years ago when the anesthetics that were used seemed to induce a state that was clearly not sleep. But with all the newer agents, I'm not aware that very many studies that would really seek to see if there are similarities or, or the brain mechanisms that are involved in sleep are involved in inducing the anesthetic state or not. I just don't know. Um, that would be sort of fruitful. Uh, the other question, I, now I've forgotten the other Oh, memory! <laughs> 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 that was deliberate. Uh, there's no question that being sleepy impairs memory, but it's, it's a very difficult to measure because measuring memory is, is fraught with complications, motivational effects, practice effects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you test some people who are very, very sleepy and then test them when they're not, when they're wide awake, you can show very, very substantial differences. Uh, I am, I think if, that I am certainly convinced on a personal basis uh, that in the evening, uh, when I'm about to leave my office, I get up quite early in the morning. So by the time it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm, I'm heading into a sleepy period of the day. I, I hate to see any of my employees because I can't remember their names. You know, I, I, I can't say goodbye, Bob, because I, goodbye, uh, fella. And uh, in the morning, when I'm wide awake and refreshed, I, you know, I know everybody's name, even my wife's. I don't know. <laughs> but I, it's really the d difference is so dramatic, you know, and I th I, that kind of thing is in a way sort of difficult to pin down because you'd, you'd test my memory in the afternoon, then you'd have to measure my degree of sleepiness and, and so on. But there is a relationship between cognitive function and, and alertness, no question. And, and a lot of it is, is a, is involves the chances that an error will occur, for example. And we think of sleep deprivation as a hidden source of human error.
in our society. Dave Olson, member. In yesterday's Oregonian, Ann Landers had a column where she, you know the column, but yeah. incident after incident of interns who, because of custom, work 32 hours a day and commit all sorts of errors, and this is right within your own profession. When are they going to wake up? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm sure you've all read about the Libby Zion case in uh, New York City. Um, Sydney Zion, her father, was one of our witnesses. <clears throat> and again, it's a, it's a situation where ignorance and uh, s the demand of society and the expectations of society and a macho attitude and has led to uh, doctors, particularly house staff, emergency room physicians pushing themselves too far. Now, the, the next threat then is the economic threat. You mean we have to have twice as many people? Uh, I think the real issue is taking the problem, uh, the issue is serious enough to really analyze it. Because many times I go into our emergency room, nobody's there. There are no patients. There, there are about four or five doctors sitting around doing nothing. Uh, you know, and if one would really analyze the time when it's, when it's heavy, it's very predictable. Um, the, uh, again, the sort of Russian roulette situation, if you were, if you were Sidney Zion, uh, you know, you just, there's just no way you could see it the way the administrators see it. And in, in, like many other things, it takes a tragedy to, to wake people up. And I think, I think uh, unfortunately, until every hospital's had its tragedy, there won't, it won't be taken as seriously as it should. We're doing what we can. And I think that, that either the commission or some of its position papers or study groups will really try to do this in, in detail. Because it doesn't help to say, hey, you shouldn't sleep. You should get more sleep because you've got to weave that into the demands of the situation. But here again, uh, there's a downtime in an emergency room. That would be a time when every doctor but one perhaps goes to a place and takes a nice hour nap. Now, that would get them, get them through the night at a much higher level of performance. And there are all sorts of things that could be done. But, but none of them are done currently. We're actually doing a study of our emergency room physicians and uh, we see a serious problem. We've got an interesting performance test. It's, it's doing um, uh, diagnostic bronchoscopy. And that, that, if, that is, turns out takes quite a bit of skill. You've got to be pretty wide awake, and your hands have got to work just right to, to get a bronchoscope down an infant's uh, trachea accurately and quickly. And, and when a physician is sleep deprived, they can't do it. Yes. Oh, but I heard a surgeon say, I was at these hearings in Sacramento uh, about a new law they wanted to pass dealing with this uh, issue, and this surgeon got up. He's a cardiovascular surgeon. He says, I mean, it's just, it's just literally like this. I can operate 100 hours without stopping. Why can't these young interns operate at least 24? You know, <sighs> can you believe it? <laughs> Last question. Um, Mary McCarthy, I'm a physician and also a member of the club, and I was fortunate to be a student of Dr. Bob Sack and Dr. Al Louie when I was in residency and learned a lot from them about sleep disorders. Uh, I have uh, two questions, one quick one. You didn't mention anything about depression and the incidence of sleep problems with depression, and since it's such a common disorder, I thought maybe you could mention some things about that. And. Uh, why don't you go ahead with that one? We have oh, time okay. On this. Uh, I actually didn't get into very much detail. Uh, on my list here, there, there are a whole set of, of uh, complaints that are associated with psychiatric disorders, and so we tend to lump them into psychiatric sleep disorders. But every, depending on the study, from 90 to 100 percent of patients with endogenous depression will, will complain about their sleep. Uh, I think that this the, uh, those who are involved in psychiatric sleep disorders believe that, number one, the biological clock is involved in etiology and that sleep mechanisms are involved. And then there are these interesting, uh, and, and of course, this, the sleep disorder, if it's 
really severe needs to be addressed as well as the mood disorder. But uh, sleep deprivation, and, and I was, the, the, if a person is not depressed, losing sleep generally kind of depresses the mood, but that's not, that's not clinical depression. Uh, that sleep deprivation has an ameliorative effect on depression, as I'm sure you know. And there's a study that was done in 1975 but has never been replicated that selective REM sleep deprivation uh, produces a, a, a long-term remission of endogenous depression. And then some of the f uh, manipulations that phase advance or phase delay uh, the period of sleep may have an ameliorative effect. And there's enough of this data to think that in some way biological clock sleep mechanisms are involved in the mood disorders. And I think that's that's a very important frontier. There are a number of other problems that you might call psychiatric. Uh, we, one of the things that isn't widely known are, the, are what are called parasomnias uh, and can be night terrors, confusional arousals, there's a REM chronic behavior disorder, but we, uh, we're going to hear testimony in our next hearing from a, <clears throat> a man who had a parasomnia, which is a waking, not waking up, but, but wild behavior occurring during sleep. But he was, in one of these episodes, trying to choke his wife. And then it, her father was staying with, the, with them, came in and tried to uh, rescue her. He then turned on the father and, and beat him up. And the police came, and, and of course he, he was then in a lot of trouble because he was, he was in effect arrested for assault. Uh, fortunately, his wife was understanding, you know, and saw it as a sleep problem. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> very understanding. She did see it as a sleep problem. He actually got to a sleep specialist of not, not it was, you know, a real specialist who actually effectively treated the problem. Uh, but then, because of that and those kinds of episodes, we sort of look around. There, there are people who are in jail because of these kinds of things when they when they have a sleep disorder and they could be treated. Uh, the issue of stress in our society, anxiety, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, in all of the areas, there's kind of a core of what you would say: these are sleep problems. Then there, there are sleep problems related to psychiatric problems. There are sleep problems related to medical problems, pediatric problems. So there's a very, very broad spectrum, but, but all of these can be, should be dealt with by a sleep specialist who knows all the ins and outs of sleep and wakefulness and their mechanisms. And sleep specialists, I should add, I see her, <laughs> she's waiting to hook me off the, <laughs> are generally come from the psychiatric, the, you know, they have to come from the psychiatric, the neurological, or the internal medicine pulmonary uh, specialties because because we don't have a residency for sleep disorders medicine. I'm sorry, we're out of time. Uh, I have a message for Dr. Gerald Rich. Would he please call his office? Thank you very much for a stimulating conversation about sleep disorders. We are adjourned.